Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of the Opportunity Podcast. I'm your host, Greg Alfrank, the head of marketing over here at Empire Flippers. And today I am talking about AI, artificial intelligence. I got Mike Kaput, the chief content officer of the AI Marketing Institute. So this is a very fun, free range conversation about everything that is happening in the space when it comes to marketing and AI which I think is super, super interesting. My team specifically, we've been diving deep into using AI and it's so much more. Like if you're my SEO friends out there or even my e-commerce friends who love SEO, like it is so much more than just, you know, content for your blog. Like there is so much more you can do with AI. So Mike and I, we get into this conversation all about what those other things look like, some things to watch out for, what the future might look like, and you will get a little sneak peek of an article I will be releasing here probably in about a week. Actually, by the time this podcast is out, it'll, the blog post will probably be out. But it's all about whether AI has killed affiliate marketing and killed search engine. So you want to check that out. If you're listening to this but haven't read that, go check out our blog. It'll be on there. But before you do that, make sure you listen to this entire podcast. Give us a like, a review, or share it on social media. It helps us out a ton. And with that said, let's get into it and talk to Mike because this guy is super smart. And there's a lot of super interesting stuff we talk about in this show. That said, I'll see you on the other side. All right, I got Mike Kaput here with me and I am very excited for this topic because my team has been diving super deep into AI and pretty much everyone I know in the marketing circle, they is nonstop AI, whether fearful and hateful towards it or like embracing it. So I'm glad to have you on here. For my audience that's not familiar with you, talk a little bit about who you are, like how did you get into this position and what the AI Marketing Institute is all about? Yeah, sure. So my name is Mike Kaput. I am the Chief Content Officer at Marketing AI Institute, and we are a business that is a media education and event company. And our whole reason for being is to help make AI and AI technology approachable and actionable for marketers and business leaders of all types and all sizes, including marketing agencies. And we are marketers by trade, myself and our founder, Paul Ratzer, who were the first people to kind of start working on this concept, we started working on Marketing AI Institute as a side project at the agency that Paul used to own. He sold it in 2021. I used to work there. I'd worked with him for almost 10 years at that point. And we started looking into artificial intelligence back in 2014, 2015 as one of the next big things that could really accelerate success for our clients. So Paul and I started publishing a very simple blog, just sharing what we were learning, the tools we were exploring, the challenges and questions we were running into. And pretty quickly, we started amassing, you know, a small but significant audience of really passionate forward thinking marketers and business people who were trying to figure this stuff out. So long story short, fast forward to today, we've got a conference that draws hundreds of people to our home base in Cleveland, Ohio every year. It's called the Marketing AI Conference. We had attendees from, I think, all 50 states and a dozen plus countries in the last couple of years. We have an online education platform and a flagship course called Piloting AI for Marketers. And we published probably at this point, 800, 900 pieces of content on how to use AI in marketing. And we've been doing this since 2016, end of 2016 is when we formally launched it as its own project. So at the end of the day, I mean, the last three months are extremely exciting because chat GPT and tools like that have really opened everyone's eyes to what we've been talking about for several years, which is AI has a tremendous possible impact on what you do as a marketer every day. So you were really on the bleeding edge then 2014, like Back in 2014, I was using like spin rewriters, like in my black hat <laughs> SEO days, you know, like it was, it was not fantastic. I actually had a friend, he commented about AI recently on one of my social media accounts saying like, oh, I've been using these tools for like five years. Like, no, you haven't. These like these tools are like <laughs> brand right. new. Like they're, this is not right. a spin rewriter. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly. Uh, <laughs> so that's cool that you guys are now probably seeing, I would assume, are getting a lot of exposure because of your market positioning there with the last few months just absolutely exploding with uh, people interested in AI. Talk to me about 
how AI can reduce costs and increase revenue. Like I know some of the basics of what that might look like. And I'm sure my audience could put two and two together too, but talk to me about some of the common ways and maybe some of the uncommon ways you can use AI to do this. Yeah, for sure. So that's a really good way to put it because those are really the two filters we counsel people to think about when they're thinking initially about how AI can impact their career, their marketing, their business is either reducing costs or increasing revenue. Typically, when you're getting started out, we see it defaults more towards reducing costs just because that's like the easier wins, but both mm -hmm. are really important. So in marketing, especially, I mean, Today, AI can do hundreds, if not thousands of different use cases across major areas of marketing. It can do everything from predicting ad performance, predicting what type of creative to use in your advertising. It can surface deep insights from your analytics. Obviously, and this is a whole part of the conversation. It can generate content. It can improve email performance. It can predict which articles you should even be writing in the first place for SEO. So Really, there's three kind of big ways that AI reduces costs or increases revenue, and that's by making data-driven tasks much more efficient and predictive. By making predictions alone, I mean, it's a predictive technology, so it helps you make predictions you either would have to do on your own or you weren't able to make in the first place. And also, it can help automate and augment really repetitive tasks. And you can kind of go down the rabbit hole into every major area of marketing. There's easily hundreds of use cases for the technology. Yeah. A lot of my friends are in the SEO world. Like that's my yeah. background in marketing. And I think a lot of my SEO friends are kind of like missing the big picture because they're thinking of it just like, let's pump out a bunch of blog posts or like, oh, Google's right. going to penalize me for blog posts. But it's like, I feel there's so much more to this than just that. Like, for example, my team, we've been trying to do content repurposing, kind of like Gary Vee does, like with just crazy amount of content, right? Which is a lot harder said than, or a lot harder to do than it sounds. Like it sounds so simple, but once you start getting up to like 20, 25 pieces a week, it can become quite the hassle, like all the manual work you have to do. So one of the things we did, which I think you mentioned was, we basically use ChatGPT to take the blog post we wanted to repurpose. We throw the link in there, which sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. I don't know like why it misses on that, but it'll summarize the whole thing. Like it'll give us like 20, 50 social status posts and like they need some tweaking, like they still need some human effort there, but it's amazing because now my content person doesn't need to read this like, you know, sometimes a 5,000, 8,000 word blog post and then come up with the things to repurpose. like it gives you like the bullet points, it gives you its best shots, all that kind of stuff. So we've already saved a significant amount of time just there, which had allowed us to expand how much content we we're doing, which is more, I guess, in the revenue generating than cost reduction, but it kind of goes hand in hand. With these tools, so I think like there's this new term, like the prompt engineer, right? Like that's becoming mm -hmm. like a new thing in the lexicon here. With these AI tools, a lot of the success of using them seems to be boiled down on making good prompts of telling it, what to do, what to think, all that kind of stuff, giving a context basically. So for someone brand new to AI that wants to like start using this, what kind of tips can you give on doing the right prompts? What are some good ground rules? So full disclosure, I'm still learning myself because this is so oh, this new. Is all pretty new. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> so I think I've started to get good enough to be kind of dangerous. I'm by no means the prompt engineering expert, but here's a mental model that I really, really like that I did not create. There's someone at OpenAI who, the makers of ChatGPT, they actually shared this, I think on Twitter. And it's this mental model when you think of prompt engineering called genius in the room. And it goes like this. So when you're prompting a machine, whether it's ChatGPT or something else that requires natural language prompts, and it could be image generation, what have you, code generation, Pretend that the machine is a genius who knows a lot about a lot of things. The genius lives next door to you and will answer any question you ask of it. But there's this big catch. You can only talk with them by sliding a note under their door. They don't know you. They don't see you. The only context they have about what you are trying to do is on that slip of paper. So anytime you think of a prompt, imagine to yourself the genius next door, the genius in the room, would they be able to execute your instructions 
to your specifications with everything that's on that piece of paper? And if the answer is no, you need to refine the prompt more. You need to offer more detail. And basically, this comes down to the idea that context is key. You want to explain the problem you're trying to solve. Talk about the output in the format. I mean, you'd be surprised. You can tell these machines literally do it in the style of a famous author or act right. like a therapist or whatever. It's pretty <laughs> breathtaking. And then give the machine, at least today, any unique knowledge it needs for the task. So you mentioned like repurposing blog posts and things. The link sometimes work, sometimes don't. If you can, just tell it, here's what the blog post is about. Here's what I'd like to repurpose. Here's how I would recommend trying to do it. So the more context you can give, the better. And you can also kind of think of it as like, if I gave this prompt to a newly hired intern, could they achieve what I wanted without coming back and asking me a bunch of questions? So that's kind of the mental model I use today. And you know, this is changing so fast that a week from now, who knows? We might not need prompt engineering anymore. <laughs> but that, Neural, that's like, really comes out, just like plug your brain into OpenAI uh, and the yeah, API yeah, works. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's cool. I want to talk about the changing pace of all this because it's already changed pretty significantly from even when ChatGPT launched. And obviously, ChatGPT is like the thing that took the world by storm, but you've been in it much longer than that. And I've known about AI tools much longer since ChatGPT, at least probably like two years, just in my mind made it a lot more accessible into the consumer's mind. Yeah. Talk to me about some of the processes you've seen in terms of increasing revenue and decreasing costs in terms of, so you mentioned email, for example, like what's an example of using AI to send better emails in terms of open rates and all that kind of stuff? Yeah, so one really practical example is something that we call send time optimization, which is pretty simple. I mean, like, for instance, we use as our CRM a tool called HubSpot, which is pretty well known. Within HubSpot, we're using it to do everything from host our website to send emails. And within HubSpot, we can actually use an artificial intelligence tool called Seventh Sense that will actually optimize email send times for when people are most likely to open an email. So this isn't even like saying, oh, okay, you know, Greg, you're in Vietnam or wherever, I'm gonna send it 9 a.m. your time. This is saying, I'm going to look back through your CRM data and predict when is the most likely time you will open an email based on your behavior. So that's a pretty straightforward, narrow use case, but it's pretty impressive because you can immediately increase open rates, engagement rates, based on when people are actually answering email, which it sounds even stupid saying it, like we should be doing this all the time, <laughs> but 99.9% .9 of the time, marketers don't even think to do that. Oh, hundred percent. We've actually, so we use HubSpot. Is that built into HubSpot or is that an add-on tool? No, it's a third party app. Okay. So you would have yeah. to just find it more like app marketplace, but it's pretty simple to use. So yeah, it's just, and I'm sure there's others that do the same thing. That's just one that I'm familiar with. Yeah, yeah. We, so we've done the try to send at the time that we think that people would open it, like their morning hours, because we have a global audience, right? But I always wonder, like, how many of those people are like me? Because, like, my workday <laughs> begins at, like, 6 p.m. And I go to, right. like, 3, 4 a.m. a lot of the time. So it's like, my schedule is very weird. If you were sending me emails at 9 a.m., like, I'm sleeping. <laughs> I'm not even awake yet. <laughs> So, yeah, and even that, thinking about cool. people's individual habits too. I mean, some people, you know, typically, okay, we could maybe assume a decent majority of people answer emails first thing in the morning or throughout the day, but some people batch emails and do it late at night. Some people, especially new parents, might be totally changing their behavior from what it was before. So having this date, now that we have you know, it's pretty standard to have at least some data on your customers, on your contacts in a CRM. It's like you can use that data to make a lot of really interesting predictions. And there's a lot of low hanging fruit still. I mean, that's just so simple. That's before you even get into any type of really, you know, sophisticated modeling of people's, you know, behaviors, preferences, desires, things like that. How much do you think these maturing AI tools, which, you know, maturing, put that in quotes, because they're all still so new, but they've gotten so significantly better recently. How much extra leverage will say like a solopreneur, which is a one man show is going to get from all of this? Like you mentioned email, there's content. I mean, we haven't even talked about images and now there's video AI that's starting to come out. How can a, a solo person really take advantage of all of this? 
I saw someone put it really well on Twitter and I forgive me, forget completely who said it, but someone was like, look, we're probably about to have a solopreneur billion dollar business at some point because the leverage that these tools give you in certain areas and the levels of maturity and capabilities are very different across different areas of marketing and business. But overall, the trend is the leverage they give you is insane. I mean, 10X in your output is like, I would say standard today in what is possible. I know for a fact today, I think that's going to hundred X at some point soon. So especially when you're thinking about content, if you run a content business, that's probably one of the higher leverage areas I would say today, just because of all the advancements in generative AI. I think if you're doing anything, you could very well be a one person content empire at this point with enough yeah, yeah. time dedicated to it, right? So, because <laughs> so th this is a funny like side note. So I mentioned we increased our content production to about 22, yeah. 23 pieces a week. But my guy that runs our YouTube channel, Nick Chi, go watch his YouTube channel audience, <laughs> like and subscribe. I've been trying to convince him to like, hey, Nick, let's deep fake your voice. And now we can produce <laughs> unlimited shorts because like, you can use a tool like Descript, speak into it for like 40 minutes or so, and it'll make yeah. like your voice and you can just type anything that you want Nick to say. You put it in something like Pictory that like automatically makes like B-roll video for the shorts. I mean, they're like, you know, 30 second, 60 second clips, right? You don't need anything massively crazy there. Usually just like text flashing in a cool way. And he's like, yeah, yeah, maybe. And then finally, like, hey, Nick, it's been like a month. Like, are we going to do this? He's like, I don't feel comfortable with it. Like, all right, I guess I'll just, I guess I'll just deep fake myself. <laughs> like, so you, you guys can use my voice. It's, it's really <laughs> but, interesting you mentioned that because we actually, last year, myself and Paul Ratzer, our CEO, released a book called Marketing Artificial Intelligence. And as part of the publishing of that book, the publisher also had us do an audiobook version. I was not involved in reading it. We just had Paul read it. And we seriously looked into trying to do that because Paul didn't want to sit in a studio for like right. three yeah. days reading for like 12 hours a day. Plus if Here's he coughs or something like that is yeah. all screwed up now. <laughs> uh, it was such a why. Yeah, he had so many stories. And he's like, I didn't realize how many things I pronounced wrong or weird. <laughs> they just tell you everything. To give you a sense of how fast this space moves at the time and we probably started looking into it i would say at the beginning of 2022 as the book came out in late june stuff we found from like google i think and from a couple other well-known tools and models it would have taken several dozen hours of paul's voice to train a model to read like him I think like a month ago, Microsoft came out with a paper on a model that they are going to start deploying. It's not commercially available yet that can train a digital clone of your voice using three seconds of audio. Ooh, three so like seconds? <laughs> yes. I, I thought I was going to trump you with something I was about to say. I, you just totally it stole my thunder. I was going so to mention. Like, uh, just think about that's within one year. And this space is just weird. moving so fast. It's getting faster. That's why it's like, especially people listening, if you tried out AI tools like 18 months ago or more, you need to get back into trying them because they've changed oh, yeah. fundamentally. <laughs> so like just a year ago, I think it was about a year ago, I was very familiar with AI tools like Jasper, for example, for AI writing. And like, I hated it. I'm a fast writer. So like, mm -hmm. I felt like they just slowed me down most of the time, but now they're like, I have a friend, he's a solo developer that he came out with a tool called ZimWriter and it basically uses the open AI API, same thing, very similar to Jasper in that sense, only he doesn't mark you up on the token. So mm -hmm. you just pay one time fee or a monthly fee to use the software and then whatever the token costs is to open AI, but you could punch out like a 5,000 word blog post in like five minutes or 20 cents, <laughs> which is wild. Yeah. But on the AI voice thing, so this is a funny story that just recently happened to me. Internet memes are some of my favorite things. And there's this company called Eleven Labs. They took a two minute voice clip of Dagoth Ur. This is so, such a nerdy topic. Dagoth Ur from Morrowind for a 20 year old game. <laughs> and he's one of the only characters in the game that's even voice. He has two minutes of monologuing. And now they were able to extrapolate that to where he can say anything as Dagoth Ur. And so there's all wow. these internet memes of Dagoth Ur as a social media influencer, like being interviewed by deepfake Joe Rogan. 
about the never ring and the <laughs> prophecy and the imperial dogs <laughs> like oh my god this is great and it made me actually buy a copy of morrowind to play it because i haven't played it since i was a kid like wow i just got deep faked into purchasing this by right. fake up or <laughs> joe rogan talking on a podcast <laughs> so I, I love this stuff i think it's hilarious and fascinating once the internet memes start you know like you're on to something <laughs> Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I think I, one big one I've seen, maybe it's just me, but I feel like it's like taken over TikTok. It's like Barack Obama, Biden and Trump all just playing Call of Duty and like <laughs> trash talking each other as they go there. I was like, oh, really oh that is it's, brilliant. It I love it. Very, very well. <laughs> Internet memes are about to go like overdrive yeah. supernova level. <laughs> oh, so this is awesome. I agree on the leverage. Like, this is such an amazing time. I have so many friends that are balking at it. Like a lot of my copywriter friends, especially, they feel pretty threatened mm -hmm. by all this stuff. So maybe we could talk about that and before we move into like the rapid development of AI. Like for my copywriter friends out there that are legitimately terrified of you know losing their jobs basically to this software, what are your thoughts there on like what do marketers have to fear on AI replacing them? And what can marketers do to become irreplaceable in this environment? Yeah, that's a good question. Now, so I'll first speak to the first part of that as someone who is a very excited writer. My entire job is content, is writing. I used to be a journalist before getting into marketing way back in the day. So writing has been, since I was a child, like integral to my identity. It's something I enjoy. One of the things I enjoy most in the world. So I get the fear. I get that you could feel like there's something threatening you or potentially taking something away from you. And I don't think those concerns are totally unfounded when it comes to some of the content we've been asked to produce in the last five years or so. I mean, we have like everyone in marketing has done the kind of really surface level, top of the funnel content to get search traffic. Like that's the game. And that's okay. Like it wasn't bad, but it became a very large part of our jobs, I would say, in a lot of copywriting and content teams. And now a machine can do that yesterday. So that's going away. That will not be your job anymore. So I know that's scary, but in my mind, I'm much more excited because did anyone really love doing that anyway? I mean, <laughs> what do you, what do you mean? You, you don't want to write <laughs> the next best seven top things ever? Right. <laughs> like, yes. What are you talking about? Right. Like? 17 top <laughs> tips or something. Uh, yeah. And it's like, I get it. Like it's good content and it's necessary for businesses, but it's like, was that if you love being a copywriter, was that like what you love to have on your plate in a day? Probably not. Uh, so I think in a lot of cases, like, this will actually free up people with really interesting original ideas and really interesting skills to actually focus more on the stuff that really is required for, in my opinion, really great writing. Like, because most of writing happens before you even touch the document, right? It's the thinking, it's the conversations, it's the research. So that stuff I think will be, will actually be able to double down in a lot of cases on the more original, more creative, in my opinion, more interesting parts of the content creation process, whether it's writing, video, whatever. I think if you're a marketer in general, you probably need to start thinking about this though, because like, it's too easy to sit back and say, oh, well, this is my job. This is what I do. Like that's going to change. It's already changing. I mean, I keep coming back to chat GPT just because it's a very accessible example. Look at some of the things this tool can do. It's not remotely perfect. It has huge problems, but it can already do some of the things that you would hire maybe a low-level marketer to actually do, like an entry-level marketer to do. I would start really seriously thinking about how you actually create value in your work and what you do that a machine can't. I think everyone's going to need to really take a step back because the future is very bright. I think we'll be able to do a lot more with a lot more leverage like we talked about. But there are going to be massive changes ahead. Yeah, I think low level writers, which is where how I started. So my background, I used to be on an oil rig and I started freelance writing when I got done working in the oil rig, like after my shift or whatever to build up my portfolio. And I was writing like some really 
you know, impressive pieces about plumbing and roofing in Ohio and Australia. Yep. So like very, very high level pieces. Right. And I was charging one cent per word to undercut everyone else just to get like as many of the jobs as possible. Right. And now with these tools, like there's no way I could compete against these tools, right. And that type of content, like there's no need because no one's reading that content, right? Like you don't like type in, fix my pipe, emergency plumbing in Chicago, and then sit and read a 5,000 word blog post. Like now you're just going to the website and calling, right? Like the content is really just there to serve Google and not the user at that point in that regard. So I think low-level writers are definitely on the way out and to a certain extent, maybe even like low-level intermediate. But from what I'm getting from what you're saying is if I was worried about this and I wanted to make sure I was going to be okay with it all, I should really focus more on strategic thinking, like the vision of how do you implement this most effectively? Is that kind of what you're getting at? Yeah, I would say so. It's like, I think some term I heard, which I really like is like, are you above or below like the API, right? Like if you're doing stuff that a machine can do, you're probably going to be in trouble. And so that gets murky though, because what's above the API, what's stuff that the machine can't do, you're going to become essentially, I don't know, like call it a machine shepherd or something. Like you're going to have to (laughs) learn how to manage these tools. And you're probably going to be as a writer, especially more in like an editor role where you're editing outputs, you're combining different outputs from different machines and systems, and you're putting it all together into something that's greater than the sum of its parts. That doesn't mean you won't write. It just means what you write will be much more original point of view. You need a strong point of view in your writing moving forward because the standardization of content is getting crazy. Like these machines can put out any generic article you can think of today and it will only get better. So there's going to be no competitive advantage, like you mentioned, to just doing content that sounds like everyone else. A huge competitive advantage is establishing a really unique voice and point of view, in my opinion, that you can't get anywhere else. I agree with that. I think right now there is a short window of an amazing gold rush where you can bank hard on that surface level content, but yeah. that's not going to last for long. Like It could last like six months, maybe even a year and a half where you can really like leverage it. But I think you're right on that standardization. For people who might not know what you mean, explain a little bit about what you mean by content standardization. So I think that several years ago, and you alluded to this, you could see really good results with the five tips for like HVAC in Ohio or whatever. (laughs) Um, If you were really smart about keyword research, about your audience, about your niche, you could produce relatively generic content that you produce by researching things you know relatively little about, write something that's actually sounds decent, isn't inaccurate, and you would capture a lot of search rankings, search traffic, and you would build authority in your domain. I don't think that's going away as a concept, but that content isn't going to be the vehicle that gets you there moving forward, in my opinion, because one, everyone is already doing it. I mean, this is why we either wrote for one cent a word or like hired people to do it. It's like the strategy worked for a while. But now it all sounds the same. There's no differentiator. And that's before we even got AI doing it. So I think you're going to see a lot of content designed for that purpose become very generic, very standard, more so than it is already. And people will gold rush towards some of these opportunities and win. But search will become unusable with those articles. You're going (laughs) to seek out the faces behind the articles, the personal brands, the point of views, the people, the perspectives that actually stand out. Because when everything sounds the same, nobody's going to pay attention to it anymore. Yeah, Marketing 101. I want to ask your opinion on this because you brought up search. What do you think is the future of search engines like Google and Bing? I have my own opinion, so maybe we might heavily disagree on this, but I'd love to hear, hear what your thoughts are. Like, Do you think it's going with the way of the dinosaur or what does the future look like there? So I'm still working out my thoughts on this, but I think I'm starting to increasingly come down on a more extreme position that it's possible might be might be (laughs) bad, like over time. Because I think about this a lot in the context of our content, like 75% of our traffic comes from organic traffic today. So 
it's a huge channel. It's the channel for us. Obviously, there's so many other marketing positions and jobs that are related to things that are essentially just predicated on getting search traffic. There's nothing wrong with that. But I struggle to see how in a future where there is a conversational interface for things like Bing search engine, Google's released a product as well, or an experiment, trying to basically do chat GPT, but with factual results. None of them are really good at this point, but if they get really good, why would you ever need traditional Google search results ever again? It seems archaic already. I anecdotally probably use Google 50% less since ChatGPT came out because like, obviously I can't solve remotely any question or query I want through ChatGPT, but like, it's just easier for the things it gets right. So if there are no more traditional search results because it seems crazy, it's like we would be looking in a phone book today. How are you ever going to get people to click through to a website based on keywords? It just won't exist anymore. So I think that could take a decade to play out, but because Google is still just a behemoth. I mean, it's not going to go quietly, but in a world where you can get actual conversational and factual responses to queries, to questions, to comments, to just like finding information. I don't see how that doesn't have a huge negative impact on traditional SEO and search-based anything. Yeah. So it looks like we're more in agreement than I expected. So <laughs> I have a lot of friends who are on either side or like, this will never change anything. And then friends who are like, for example, we had a business, I think it was like a $400,000 affiliate website. And most affiliate and AdSense websites are driven by SEO traffic. And this buyer backed out like the ninth inning more or less because of all the explosion of chat GPT. He got scared like, oh my God, Google's dead. So in my view, I think Google is going to be fine. I think they're going to still be a dominant player for like what you said, probably a decade. And I actually just wrote an article I'm coming out with where I think the fastest possibility of AI like totally destroying a search engine is probably like two years, which I think is really unlikely, extremely yeah. like everything has to go perfect, which based on Bing's AI having a literal mental breakdown over the last week or so, <laughs> I don't think where that's going to happen. Like things are already right. going wrong, right? But then like, I think in five years, something could really change. And I think the biggest thing that people aren't thinking about is kind of what you said, where like Google search today is the modern version of the yellow pages of the phone book, but they yeah. do not look like each other at all. Like they're a totally different format. And I think the future of search with where AI truly takes over, is not going to look anything like what Google and Bing has today. Like you yeah. said, it will be archaic. It will be the old mode of doing it which I don't think we're any or close to that yet. So I think most of my SEO friends can, you know, calm down on that front probably. Right. <laughs> well, it's, I'm curious about your opinion on this because I think it almost misses the question. Like when people say, is this going to kill Google? Like maybe Google tomorrow figures out how to preserve its advertising business yeah. in a new search format. I think the question is, is the traditional search results page dead? Like Google might be fine, to your point. I mean, they might figure out a way to just monetize a conversational search interface. But like in a world where nobody clicks through to websites based on keyword searches, that's a monumental impact. Huge. Yeah, it changes the very fabric of the internet. And so like... The way I've been looking at it, it, this is a big reason why I don't think anything significant is going to happen to Google for like five years at least. Because if you look at how much it costs, and these are just numbers I researched, so they could be wrong, but to implement like a full blown AI search system that replaces all the queries with AI with like something like ChatGPT, for example, it would cost Google an additional like $30 billion a year. They make about yep. $54 billion right now. <laughs> and it would absolutely crush their search, which I don't know what their revenue is on that. But they're also, since no one's going to a website, like, they make $16 billion a year from GDN, the Google Display Network. Those are the ads you see on sites. Now, that's also mixed in with YouTube. So I don't know like how much of that is YouTube and how much is like on a website. But they stand to lose potentially up to an additional $16 billion 
plus whatever happens to search because no one knows how to monetize the conversational interface yet. So it's like, I don't think Google is literally going to gut the most profitable business in the world yeah. in a chase to like catch up with ChatGPT. Like they didn't want to release Bard. Like that happened because <laughs> their investors like forced them to do it. And then it yeah. led to all these problems that made them lose like a billion. Like, well, I told you we did this already. <laughs> I think it'll be extremely different when we do get to that point. And to your point about like seeking out voices you can trust, I think that will become even more important. And especially once the deep fakes of voices, like what I was joking about earlier today, really takes mm -hmm. off, like you're really going to want that. I think the good actors can probably use that to make like really solid content. But yeah, people are going to look more and more for that authenticity in this sea of standardization. <laughs> yeah, for sure. I think there's a very real chance we have you know, we've already seen the trends towards this before any of the recent AI developments like this is why influencers are such a huge thing is with, in a yep. world of noise, we trust individual voices, whether they're right or wrong, we gravitate towards the real, towards the authentic, towards the individual. I think that's just going to be supercharged in the next five years. It's going to be interesting. It's going to be a challenge to know who it even is not an AI soon. Like, yeah. have you seen what Korea is doing with digital influencers? We wrote a bit about various AI influencers in the book. I don't know if we looked at Korea specifically, but yeah, there's definitely like digital avatars that are just, hey, that very transparent about I'm an AI and people, there are millions. <laughs> Check of out this purse. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's wild. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I looked at a few of their accounts. They have like pretty massive followings. I forget the company that kind of like spearheaded it, but what a fascinating time where you have AI that looks like people acting as influencers. And then on the opposite side, you have these YouTubers who are using technology to look like digital avatars wearing like bodysuits, like the whole VTuber movement that's like huge in Japan. Like, what a wild time. <laughs> the person that looks yeah. like medieval knight is the actual person, is the actual human. <laughs> One of the main reasons I ended up even getting interested in AI is since I've been a child, I've been a huge science fiction fan, like a big science fiction reader. And so that was just like, obviously AI is like features so prominently in a lot of like sci-fi books oh, and yeah. movies, but I truly like some of the things I've read, I'm like, oh my God, I thought this was ridiculous when I read it, that there's AIs talking to AIs, but it's like, no, we're kind of there. We're getting it. <laughs> my friend sent me a screenshot of, he uses Microsoft Office and like in all of his business stuff. And the screenshot was of a guy sending him an email him summarizing the email through ChatGPT, responding to him, and his person that got that email also summarized what he sent through ChatGPT. <laughs> <laughs> Speed it up. So yeah, we're already there. It like, you know, it didn't cause like, you know, the next Terminator war. It was much more mundane <laughs> right. than that. But I'm with you on the sci-fi stuff. I think AI is brilliant. I've been into this stuff. I mean, not as deeply as you. I'm more of a layman, but yeah, I think this is miraculous stuff. So let's talk about the fast pace of change here. So if I'm an entrepreneur, I'm full on board wanting to leverage AI to the hilt, but things do change so fast. Like what's your advice on me staying abreast of all those changes and making sure I'm up to standard? Because like even three months ago, the landscape was radically different than it is right now. Yeah. So not being an entrepreneur myself, but being kind of a helper to one who is running this company. <laughs> I will uh, I will say that a few things that really stand out to me about this space that I would keep in mind if I'm an entrepreneur is that you probably want to, and this seems obvious, but you know, there's a lot of books out there and I'm not saying don't read our book or whatever. Our book is really good. You should read it. Um, Buy it, put it into ChatGBT. <laughs> exactly right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the next edition, we might not actually end up writing. Who knows? We'll <laughs> say Chat GPT might be the author on that. But um, I think you actually really do need to figure out who to be following in the space. And you probably should be using Twitter as your main curation source for information because it moves so fast. Like I told you, we do a weekly podcast. I don't even do the prep for the podcast, I used to try to do it more in advance and it was pointless because things would come out over the weekend that just torched any prep I had done. So <laughs> it's literally day by day 
in 2023, where things can change in 24 hours dramatically. So I'd say if you're following the space, you probably want to start with the most real-time information. Obviously, going and reading all the foundational books and understanding it deeply is really important, but you truly cannot wait for like a weekly or monthly article or magazine or source to be updating you on this stuff. It will be out of date. So that's one. Two, I would say be really smart about what technology you build your company around. The tools can change so fast and there's always a flavor of the day or week. You probably are not, it would be really difficult, I think, as an entrepreneur to commit to saying, okay, we're going to build something in this space and build it on whatever, a certain language model. The language models update so quickly, you could be obsoleted very quick. So I would not look at this as an entrepreneur. If you're looking to build AI technology, you need to be really, really smart about which platforms, solutions, and models that you're building your company around. But that also goes for a non-AI company. If you sit here and say, oh, shoot, I looked into whatever AI writing tool, let's build our marketing content program around that, I would probably have a few backups as well, just in case, because these tools can change. They can be obsoleted very quickly. So yeah, I would say those two are really the big things that would jump out to me. That makes total sense. It's very similar to what I give in terms of marketing advice because digital marketing changes extremely rapidly. I mean, nowhere close to AI, obviously, but the way we do digital marketing, I mean, there's new channels that are now billion dollar channels that literally didn't exist two years ago, like TikTok, for example, right? I guess they existed, but they weren't a billion dollar market yet. So like I often think in terms of frameworks and strategies and like Mm -hmm. principles, strategy, and then tactics. So like principle, like what is the mission? Like the, you know, the very top level stuff. And then the strategy, like what's my general thing I want to do? Like social media, all that kind of stuff. And then, all right, what's my tactic? And that's where I think the AI tools live. Like, because you have the same strategy and different tactics to make the strategy happen, right? So I think seeing the AI is not core to your business, but an ancillary a way to supercharge, speed up your strategy, I think is probably the safer bet if you're really going all in with AI. I mean, what, what are your thoughts? Yeah. Do you think that sounds about right? No, that's exactly it. I mean, if you can actually, and that's what we try to teach at the Institute is we really, you know, we certainly make all sorts of tactical and tool-based recommendations that are really important and valuable, but it's really about the frameworks and strategies of thinking through how do you use this stuff to create long-term value for your business? Because it moves so fast, you have to rely on the very least like big picture principles to guide your thinking. Because if you sat down and said, I'm going to make a five-year roadmap of how AI is going to impact our business today, good luck. I mean, if you can do it, that's awesome. (laughs) You are going to be the first trillionaire. (laughs) That's awesome. Yeah, for sure. You shouldn't (laughs) avoid doing it, but I wouldn't expect it to not change. Like yeah. our assumptions today could be completely obsolete a year from now. So it really does help. That's why, you know, at least in our little space of the industry that we've carved out is just actually understanding this stuff at a foundational level. We've been able to kind of extract more frameworks and principles to say, okay, like we don't know where a lot of this stuff is going. It can change. It surprises even people way more expert than us. But we do have a sense of what's possible and what that could mean for our business. And we're going to at least kind of skate towards where we think the puck is going. Yeah, that makes sense. Let's change topics here a little bit on the ethical concerns here of using AI. Because there's, you know, things are coming out in terms of like mid-journey and Dolly. There's the rumbling of a lawsuit. Like, I think they'll win personally. Like, I maybe they'll get hit with a fine. But in general, like, I write fiction. I write poetry and stuff. And I'm inspired by other artists. So I think like the argument probably won't hold water in the end, but what are your concerns on using AI and why is it extremely ethical of me to deep fake Gary V and the liver King to play D and D with me? (laughs) (laughs) I love that. That would, uh, I think that would do some real numbers. It's it's good. It's safe underneath parody laws. So uh, (laughs) (laughs) awesome. 
This is a really hard question because to your point, nobody has figured it out yet. The lawsuits are pending. They probably will win, but there's no real precedent for any of this, as far as I know, from my limited understanding of copyright law. I think as a business, you do, especially if you're building kind of a bigger business, especially like bigger enterprise, you need to be really smart about this stuff because nobody is figuring it out. You cannot assume the tech company selling the solution has figured it out because they often haven't. They're often releasing things very quickly and not having any type of guardrails in place and just kind of hoping it all works out or retroactively. <laughs> yeah. um, that's happened multiple times. So Break things, hope you can fix it later if you can't build something yeah. new <laughs> real quick to like yes. cover that mess up. <laughs> so it's like kind of incumbent on business leaders, entrepreneurs, or people working at companies to be proactive in how they're going to use the technology and understanding that you might have to be the one that figures out what the risks are, how they impact your business. I'm kind of with you as someone that also dabbles in fiction. It's like, if I write a scene in a novel, it's 100% inspired by things I've read in the past that were really cool. And I'm synthesizing them, adding my own thing. Is that taking the author's work? I don't think so, but that's also just my opinion. Yeah. It could get dicey with visual stuff too. I totally understand if you're an artist with a specific visual style and AI can duplicate that. Yeah, that wouldn't be fun to see if I was an artist. There, um, there is a, just so I don't forget this point about the visual medium stuff, there is a weird revival of a very old Japanese art form on Etsy of these people like it was an art form that only had like a few pictures of this one type of art from medieval Japan. And that's it. That was all it could do because no surviving pieces lasted. But then Etsy sellers, the internet marketers of the land started using like mid journey to create brand new original images and artwork in this exact same style oh, wow. and selling it on Etsy. So now more than ever before, there is more of this Japanese art form that has ever existed in the history of humanity because they're taking all these different things from mid journey to recreate this medieval art style, which I it just triggered my memory of it. Like what a wild thing that is. That's so <laughs> cool. But I mean, yeah. And that's kind of the positive side of it that I think people don't consider, but I do think the bigger point is it is the wild West and I wouldn't be surprised I think some of the recent stuff with ChatGPT, with Google Bard and Bing also delivering some highly flawed conversational results in some ways. We, Existential we, kind of have always, <laughs> right. we have always been of the opinion for a while that like government is always really slow to react to things like this. And historically, regardless of what they've been saying, like hasn't been a ton of actually substantial AI focused regulation and legislation. But I think now that this has gone mainstream, the governments may move a little faster than expected. So I don't know if they'll be right or wrong, but I wouldn't be surprised if we see more formal attempts at the very least exploring regulations around this stuff, because it's really just like Pandora's box is open. I mean, I don't even know how you would tell like these things are trained on such vast data sets. I mean, there people are starting to work on ways that maybe and i think the next version of mid journey they're going to or maybe stability stable diffusion they're going to let people opt out of training it on their art or their data but i don't know how effective that's even going to be this just yeah. feels like it moves so fast and improves so quickly that i'll be honest personally i've kind of written it off as like okay it's just gonna happen <laughs> that that's that's where i'm at as well it's like yeah. Yeah. If you like, I have friends who are using Mid Journey to create awesome branding for brand new products. Like a buddy of mine is launching a supplement. He has this awesome tiger. It looks cool. It's all wrapped around the product. And it's like an actual designer did it, but it all through Mid Journey, which was amazing. Wow. It did it so quickly. But like, no one's coming after that guy for his like supplement tiger right. <laughs> like right. you know like i mean maybe they could happen this is not legal advice nor financial advice <laughs> right, <laughs> right. yeah don't take this <laughs> but like i just seems so unlikely you know so i'm with you on that front too like it's just a foregone conclusion i feel in terms of like common myths and misconceptions about ai what would you love to put to rest like what's your favorite pet peeve that people think about ai that's just simply not true it's a really good question i was thinking about this a lot 
I think that it really starts off, despite all the advancements we've seen, and this stuff is can feel really magical, and that's part of the fun of it. You have to just realize like artificial intelligence, at least today, who knows, 50 years from now, maybe we'll have the Terminator. I don't know. That could happen. <laughs> I mean, yeah, so you're, on the, you're very much on the hope side of this equation. Right, <laughs> <that> right. <laughs> so don't quote me on this 50 years from now when <laughs> we're no longer here because, you know, Skynet has taken over. But <laughs> today, I would say you got to get away from the science fiction stuff of it. It's super compelling as much as I love the science fiction idea of AI, these are not sentient machines. They don't feel anything. They're not exhibiting agency, self-awareness, any type of independent behavior. They often do things we don't expect, but it's all for mathematical reasons. And we don't expect them or know about them because sometimes the models themselves can be so complex that people creating them don't always have full insight into what is happening. And that's scary and that's interesting and impressive, that powerful so you have to be aware of those concerns, but you just got to put to rest finally. Like these are not intelligent machines today. Yeah, I mean, they can yeah. be intelligent like tasks, but you cannot view this as some big, crazy, hairy, like science fiction thing you'll never understand that's so way beyond you. It's real technology that has real effects and is usable today by any person on earth, regardless of experience. So I think sometimes that idea can just be so overwhelming for people, but you're going to have to start using it. No matter who you are, what you do, you will have to start experimenting with it. Otherwise, you're going to be seeing some pretty serious existential risks in your career, in your business. I think it's so fascinating. I don't know if this is true or not. I read it, I think a few weeks ago, but there was these machine learning or AI experts that were talking about like they don't know why the AI is doing this. Like yeah. they don't understand why it does this and that. So now they've started building AI where the AI has to tell them how did it come to this conclusion? Like, what is it doing? So like you're using the AI, like I built a machine that does stuff that I don't understand. So now it needs right. to tell me what I built. <laughs> like, like, there's a sort of like poetry to it. <laughs> like, right. it so there's still some magic That's, in it. Yeah. When you hear that, yeah, it's easy to think like, oh man, like, they've kind of gone off on their own. And it's like, well, not really. Like they're it's just not yeah. really what's happening. Right. So, yeah, it, but it is crazy. That is a real thing. I mean, explainability in AI is a huge challenge because oftentimes if something does go wrong or happens that you don't expect, you can't just ask the person that worked on it, hey, why did it do that? They don't always know. Yeah. There's this one other thing I'll ask. I'll move on to a business question, but there was a, this story I read about AI, like, I think it was on a Wait But Why post or something like that, where basically AI, like, it thinks so differently than you because it's literally not human. It's like the yeah. same thing, like comparing a culture between a human and a spider, like totally different moral systems, ethical systems. Like these are aliens when it comes to like the higher functioning of what they would be doing. And that's often yeah. why it can come to conclusions that we think is so strange, but like, it would look at us like if it could think like why would you do it this way <laughs> like would you do this this well, is a completely different framework it's working from that's a really good point and it's hard to visualize that sometimes cuz we're literally anthropomorphizing these tools right? right we're thinking we're like intelligent like we are intelligent a really interesting example of that and i'm paraphrasing this story but i read one time someone you know, we'll build like AI systems to try to win games like video games or things or board games. And all you're really at the end of the day doing is telling the system to achieve a goal, right? So the goal is whatever winning looks like. And it figures out ways to do it by essentially testing a lot of different approaches and in many cases playing against itself or what have you. Just to give an example of what you talked about, there was one system, I forget what video game it was, where the AI is just optimized to win the game as efficiently as possible. And for whatever reason, the parameter here was the game is won when the game is over. And so it found out that the quickest way to do that was to like alter some parameter in the game that caused it to crash. <laughs> like it didn't, it didn't even win the game. It just, it said, oh, okay. You're saying that when this screen comes up or like it's over that I won, 
oh, that's the quickest way to do it. So it's just, yeah, it's a total <laughs> alien. <laughs> I think that's the real threat, by the way, to people who are specifically people who have made a career of speed running video games. Your days are numbered when, once AI oh, yeah, starts to increase sure. speed runs on YouTube. <laughs> <laughs> like, they just sure. like do every glitch imaginable. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> we've been away from AI speed running. So with the Marketing AI Institute, along with Drift, you guys put together a state of the industry report on the usage yeah. of AI in marketing. So. Talk to me a little bit about this report. Like how much data did you guys get and what was some of the interesting findings you had? Yeah. So in 2022, we released the second annual state of marketing and sales AI report with Drift, which is a major AI conversational AI company in the marketing space. And as part of this past year's report, we surveyed, I think it was about more than 700 marketing and business leaders and sales leaders about, you know, giving them probably over a dozen questions about AI understanding, readiness, competency. And then we asked them to also rate dozens of different use cases for artificial intelligence. And some of the big thing, I mean, the results are pretty interesting in the sense, it just feels like so many people today still think that Everyone has heard of AI and understands it. And it's actually, I mean, that's true, especially with ChatGPT. We'll see what the numbers look like this year. But marketers are starting to wake up to this fact. I mean, I think it was like 51% of them said AI was critically or very important to their marketing success over the last 12 months or the next 12 months rather. But they still lack lots of confidence in training. So they either say they're still at a very beginner level, and we see this anecdotally with our audience quite a bit. Anytime you think an organization says they're doing a ton with AI, I mean, sometimes they are, but very rarely are people as far along as they represent, or they know that they have very little knowledge of this stuff. And one of the big gaps we saw was just training internally. I mean, there's not, and this is part of the reason we exist, there's not a ton of really practical training out there, aside from cobbling together what you can find on the internet, to actually start using this stuff in marketing. That's why we created our Piloting AI for Marketers course. It's why we run a free intro to AI course every few weeks. You really have to connect the dots for marketers and business people. And that was one of the big things that came out of the report is just their companies don't aren't equipped to do this yet. They don't have like... You know, maybe they have some AI people that are on the tech side, like engineers and things, but they're not able to really educate marketers and leaders about thinking through practical business focused use cases for the technology. So that's really the biggest takeaway, I would say, from last year's report is that we are hitting this like inflection point, but there is a major gap in the market when it comes to education. I can 100% believe that. <laughs> I'm not surprised at all. Like just in like well-established marketing stuff like Facebook ads, like I'm still learning brand new things I had no idea about. And even in SEO, I've been impressed by new things that pop up. I mean, even masters of the craft in marketing, they're more similar to a journeyman than a master. <laughs> so yeah. like that, that, that is interesting to hear. I'm going to be, you do the report once a year? Yes. So we are just now firing up this year's survey. So yeah, we'll be doing it again this year. When does the next one come out? Do you do it at the end of the year or after the survey is completed? We're ideally eyeing like midway through the year to release okay. this year's. But yeah, we're just getting the survey kind of retooled, seeing if we need to add any questions. But it'll be a big year for it. I'm really curious to see how the numbers change thanks to some of the AI tools in the news and really this trend that we're finally seeing go mainstream. Yeah, I'm going to be very curious on that, too, because it sounds like your last one probably came out right before this giant rush <laughs> across the world. Yeah, so. <laughs> it probably came out, I think it came out in like June, I want to say, maybe July. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, we were just a few months ahead of all this craziness. Oh, we'll, yeah. we'll definitely put the link to at least to the old report down below so the audience can go like in the podcast notes or the YouTube description of this video. So we'll put that down there for people to check out and then your new report. So we're at the end of the podcast, so I want to ask you three rapid-fire questions. Are you ready? This is the most important yeah, part I'm of ready. the show. Okay, cool. <laughs> <laughs> it's really not, but I'd like to build it up. <laughs> All right, the first rapid-fire question for you is, what is the best hidden growth opportunities in AI 
for an online business owner or marketer? So I'm going to kind of answer this twofold. I think the hidden growth opportunities are one, determining how your content and how your perspective on the market, it cannot be duplicated by a machine, really sitting down and deep diving on saying, okay, whatever you do, whatever content you create, how can you make it actually different than what a machine can output? And then I think at the same time, the hidden growth opportunity is taking that unique perspective that nobody else can do but you and scaling it using AI content tools. Like you could literally be doing in whatever industry, if you form a strong point of view on your market, you could be doing a weekly, maybe a multiple times a week podcast, sharing your thoughts. And you as a solopreneur could be using AI to scale that podcast with an hour of recording or whatever into dozens of different pieces of content and essentially just take over the conversation in your industry with a really well thought out point of view that nobody else can even touch because it's based on your own unique perspective, experience, and expertise. Yeah, I love that. There's a lot I could unpack there, but it's a rapid fire section. So I won't. But what tools or resources would you recommend for people who want to make good use of AI? You know, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention marketingaiinstitute.com is a is a good starting resource. We do have tons of really well crafted education, both free and paid, that is really designed to be extremely practical. Like we're a small startup running a business. We used to be doing this with clients as well. So it's all real world education that I would highly recommend you check out. Honestly, too, I'd go back to figure out which voices are sharing the most interesting things on like a platform like Twitter. I think you can learn a lot in real time by just following some of the main people in the space and starting to get a sense of what people are talking about and how they're talking about it. Just a quick follow up to that. Who are some of the main people on Twitter? Like obviously you guys, but who else would you recommend? Yeah. So a couple people recently that I've been paying attention to. So first, anyone who runs one of the major AI companies. So I'm going to actually make sure I don't get his name wrong. I'm like one guy who runs Stability AI is named Imad, E-M-A-D, Mostak. He is the CEO, I think, of Stability AI. He has a lot of really good commentary. Anyone that works at OpenAI, I would start following. They are very active on sharing, almost as like their first announcement, sharing things, really interesting thoughts on Twitter. If they're talking about a topic quite a bit, you can expect to probably be hearing about it soon in terms of a product development or a release. I would say also Allie K. Miller is a kind of friend of the Institute. She used to head up AI at Amazon, AI investments, I think. Now I think is doing her own thing. She is really savvy about sharing great content about actual businesses and AI use cases for startups. And then I think also Robert Scoble, who is like a longtime tech reporter, I think, but he has really started doing a magnificent job curating thousands and thousands of AI Twitter accounts and sharing some of the best things from them. So for sure, those three, you could get a long way just looking at what they're doing. I wonder if that last guy is using AI tools to help him synthesize through all I the hope so, because otherwise <laughs> he must be doing this 25 hours a day with the amount of things he surfaces. <laughs> <laughs> that is awesome. All right. My final question and the most difficult and important question. What has been your funniest moment working in the AI world and the marketing world? Funniest moment? You know, honestly, like very few things recently in my career have just given me more joy and just hilarity than just messing around with chat GPT. And it's just incredible. And, and also image generation tools. Like it's been hilarious like the star of my fantasy football text thread because i just make crazy stories and illustrations like kind of making fun of our friends like when they lose so it's just been you know, there's so many ways you can use those tools for humor i'll just sit here for like hours <laughs> and experiment with them and just like laugh to myself like a crazy person well, i have a friend group on facebook and we're always giving each other a crap right and like one guy, he's trying to work out. So I always do put a picture of him as a seed in mid journey with like a picture of him <laughs> McDonald's, like eating hamburgers. And it's just like all this AI imagery of him just like 
becoming an absolute slob with his diet all the time. That's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like there's we, we're only scratching the surface of like AI powered trash talking to our friends oh, that right. I think yeah. I might need to experiment more with. I mean, that we all know where the true innovators of that will come from. 4chan. <laughs> <laughs> They were probably the ones that made the day got third meme that made me buy more. Right. <laughs> They're probably already on top of this, right? That's uh, well, point. <laughs> well, then it's been awesome chatting with you. If someone wanted to reach out to the AI Marketing Institute or to you personally with questions or anything like that, where's the best place for them to do that? Sure. So definitely just head to the website, marketingaiinstitute.com. We've got contact form, chat, pretty easy to get in touch with us. If you want to get in touch with me personally, Feel free to email me, mike at marketingaiinstitute.com or find me on LinkedIn. It's pretty obvious. There's not a lot of people with the last name Kaput, I don't think, <laughs> on LinkedIn. Um, so yeah, feel free to reach out to me there and connect as well. I try to be pretty active there as well. It's probably the main channel I'm most active on socially for the business. So I would say, yeah, that would be a good way to get in touch. Awesome. Well, thanks for coming on, Mike. It was a pleasure. Oh, it's a pleasure. Thank you so much. There you have it. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope it got you inspired at all the different things that are happening in this industry. And of course, if you just want to buy a highly profitable business, you can always go to empireflippers.com slash marketplace, or maybe you want to make an exit of your highly profitable business, and you could go to empireflippers.com slash sell your site. I've been your host, Greg. If you enjoyed this episode, make sure you leave a review. Give us a like, a follow, share it across social media. Talk to you all soon. See you on the next episode.